Father God, as we open your word this morning, as we turn to this psalm that many of us know so well, we thank you that you know us. But we ask that as we study these words over the next uh, four weeks or so, that you will help us to know you even better. May we know what you are like in your character. May we know what you are like as our Father and Creator. May we be closer to you as a result of looking at these words together. Will you speak to us this morning as we open your word? And we ask this prayer in your name. Amen. Amen. Do you know someone, do you have someone in your life who thinks they know everything? I didn't ask you to put your hand up, Aidan. <laughs> not supposed to be confessing on other people's behalf. Do you know somebody who uh, seems as if they're a real know-it-all? I was going to say, if you do, don't look at them, but Aidan's already given the game away. Sorry. <laughs> do you know somebody who thinks that they know everything? One of my mum and dad's favourite comedians when we were growing up was Max Boyce. Anybody else like Max Boyce? Yeah? Uh, they went to see him once in a gig at the Norwood Rooms in Norwich, which doesn't exist anymore. There's been a mecca bingo hall for goodness knows how many years. Uh, but they came away from that gig with a tape uh, called I Know Because I Was There. And uh, it's, it's a great tape. In fact, I, I was really pleased that about, I guess, maybe 10 to 15 years ago, I managed to find a second-hand LP of it online somewhere, and I managed to get this recording so that I can listen to it now. But some of my um, best childhood memories, if you like, that I can remember, is of travelling out from Norwich to Lowestoft to go to the beach on a Saturday and putting this cassette on in the car and the fa whole family laughing together as we listen to Max and his jokes. One of the stories he tells is when he's winding his way through the streets of Cardiff after a Scotland-Wales match. And as he's walking through these streets, he hears a noise from the darkness off to his right. Hey, what's... Come here. And he turns round and he sees this man struggling with this huge, enormous pig. And he says... What on earth are you doing with this pig? And the man says, I want you to help me to get it into the house, up the stairs, and into the bath. And so for whatever reason, whatever foolish reason, Max agrees, and he gets this pig into the house and up the stairs and into the bath. And when they've done that, he stands and he says to the man, now tell me, what is this all about? And the man says, well, it's the wife, you know. What, she's one of these people that whatever I tell her, she knows. I came home a few weeks ago and I said to her, I see, now this does date the joke a little bit, I see that Princess Anne has had a baby boy. I'll let you count back how many years that might be. And she said, yeah, I know. I came back a few days ago and I said, I see Gordon McQueen's had a record transfer to Manchester United. And she said, yeah, I know. And I came back a few days ago and I said to, the, said to my wife, I see that the retail price index is up 0 0.468, the most since January 1968. And she said, yeah, I know. Well, tomorrow morning, now she always gets up before me. She'll go to the bath, find this pig and run back to me screaming, woo, there's a pig in the bath. And I'm going to say, yeah, I know. He tells it much better than I can. But that woman didn't know everything. And the people in your life who think that they know everything, they don't know everything either. And we don't know everything, do we? Especially when it comes to our future. Especially when we think about the direction in which we're headed. We don't know everything. I look back over my life, and when I was seven years old, I was absolutely convinced, absolutely convinced, that I was going to be the general of the Salvation Army. I'm now pretty certain that God and the Salvation Army has other ideas. When I came and I was doing my A-levels, I thought that I was going to go out to work when I finished them. Uh, probably work for Norwich Union, because that's what most people in Norwich did at that time. 
And then my A-level teacher said I really needed to go to university, and so off I went to university. As I went through my university years, I had no idea what I was going to do in terms of work, and then I hit upon being a lawyer. Hadn't really thought about it up until those times. Had no idea what the future held. Had no idea as, what, as to how, what the future held as far as where I was going to live. I, I was actually quite happy in Norwich. Never thought about moving out of Norwich. And then when I moved to go to university, that opened um, other avenues, and I ended up being in Coventry, and then I met Gail, and it was Cradley Heath, and then uh, on into ministry. And ministry, had no idea what future ministry would look like. I was made a musical section leader when I was 21, and I was quite happy doing that, and thought that's what I was going to do for the rest of my time. And then God had other ideas, and here I am today. And I guess that many of you would be able to say, tell the same kind of stories, that life has taken good turns and sometimes bad turns, and we're not really sure about what the future holds. We don't know what the future is like. Life is full of uncertainties, isn't it? Good things, lots of good things, but some difficult things to face as well. And we have no idea what the future holds. But the promise of Psalm 139 is that God knows you and he loves you. That's the overall promise of Psalm 139. We see it right in the first verse. The first verse says this, O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know everything about me. And that's the heart of biblical revelation. That's exactly what scripture tells us from beginning to end. That God knows us and he knows everything about us. We have a God who searches for us. Isn't that amazing? God searches for us. We often think that humanity and and human living is about our search for God. And there is definitely something in that. But much more, God searches for us. It's God who sees us. It's God who knows us. It's God who accepts us and loves us. And it's his grace that bridges the gap between his acceptance and his judgment. God knows us and loves us. The only person in the whole of the universe who knows everything, whatever other people might try to tell you, is God himself. God is the only one who has full knowledge. And just have a look and see what this full knowledge is like. This is what verse 6 says. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. God's knowledge of us and of creation goes far beyond anything that we can imagine. Any knowledge that we can have. First of all, his knowledge is of our full range of activity. Whatever we do, God knows what we do. That's what the psalmist tells us. So the psalmist says that God knows when you get up in the morning. I guess that probably means that he also knows whether you get out of the right side of the bed or not. I'll let you decide what he knows about that this morning. God knows when we get up in the morning. I guess that means he knows how we like our coffee in the morning as well, or whatever it is that we drink and eat when we get up. The psalmist says he knows when we eat. He knows what we eat. He knows when we sit down, And he knows when we stand up. He knows when we're traveling somewhere and he knows when we're at home and he knows when we go to sleep at night. So that means he knows whether we're one of those people who can go to sleep as soon as our head hits the pillow or whether we're one of those people who, um, you know, has things going around in their head and take a little while to go off to sleep. He knows everything that we do. And here's the really amazing thing. At least I find it amazing. I hope you do too. Verses 15 and 16 tell us that this knowledge of us 
And I can't get my head around this. This is why the psalmist says it goes beyond anything that we can know. His knowledge of us predates us even being in existence. So he knew us completely and fully before he even created us and brought us into being. Isn't that amazing? Yes. I was hoping a few more people would look amazed than that. I guess we've heard it so many times, but it is. It's amazing. How can we get, as humans, can we get our head around that kind of knowledge that God knew us fully before he even created us? And he knew us when we were in our mother's womb, being knit and woven together. Before we even came into the world, he knew us. And every day was planned out for us. But it goes even beyond that. God says, uh, the psalmist says that God doesn't just know everything that we do, but he knows even deeper than that. So he knows why we do things. He knows our motives. He knows our unexpressed thoughts. Verse 4 says, You know what I am going to say even before I say it, Lord. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, even before I formed it in my own mind. You know what I am going to say. How does he know us this deeply? Well, that first verse tells us, that he examines us. Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. And that that idea of examining is about searching through us. And in Jewish thought, the same kind of word and the same kind of thinking was used to describe digging deep into a mine or exploring a foreign land or investigating a legal case. That's, That's the kind of knowledge and examination that God has of us. Now, what does this mean for our future? Well, it means that only God knows what our future is. Verse 16, which uh, will come up on the screen, says, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if God knows us before he even brings us into existence, then he must know the future as well. He must know the moments we have not yet had, going off not just to the rest of our lives, but into eternity. If he knows our beginning or our pre-beginning, then he must know our future too. But it's more than that. It's more than head knowledge. It's more than academic knowledge. God knows our future because he is sovereign. He is God. And so not only does he know our future, but he molds our life journey. Now that doesn't mean that he kind of moves us around as puppets or robots and and says, this is the path that you're taking. He's given us free will. He's given us free choice. But even that free will and that free choice is secondary to God's reign over the universe. Have you ever noticed, because I've noticed it in my life, how God very often works around our mistakes? Have you noticed that? Our choices, even the bad choices that we make, are secondary to God's sovereign power in our life. And the Bible promises us that even when we're blown off course by the devil, he has less power over us than God has power over us. God still reigns even when we get blown off course by the devil. Do you realize that when we make mistakes, when we do wrong, when we sin, and we all do it, God is not surprised God doesn't suddenly say, oh, I didn't expect her to do that. I didn't expect him to take that course. His will will be done one day. Even if we're not in his will today, it will be done one day. So how can we be sure that we are following the direction that God wants us to take that God has planned planned out for us. Well, I believe the best thing that we can do is to pray for discernment. 
I think that's what the psalmist does at the end of this psalm. He goes through all of the things that God is like, and we'll break those down over the next few weeks. He even talks about his enemies. But then he comes to a place at the end of the psalm where he says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That's a prayer, I believe, for discernment. And as I was looking uh, around, uh, for, uh, around this sermon and as I was planning it out, I came across an article written by Karen Barber, who's a writer on prayer. And she says, and I thought this was really helpful and I thought I would bring it to you, she says that there's a difference between praying for discernment and praying for direction. We often pray for direction, don't we? And when we pray for direction, what we're really asking God is, can you tell me what to do? What choice do I need to make in this situation? I've got two ways I can go, maybe three or four ways that I can go. What do you want me to do in this situation? Where do you want me to go? How do you want me to be obedient in this situation? That's what we're doing when we're praying for direction. And Karen Barber says that when we pray for discernment, instead of asking what or where or how, we're asking why. We're asking God when we pray for discernment to help him to clarify the situation that we're in, to get to the root of the problem perhaps that we're facing. We're asking God to help us gain insight. Why? To help us to see more clearly. And so the kind of questions that we ask when we're seeking discernment might be things like, why do I get so angry? Why, when somebody irritates me and frustrates me, do I get so angry? Not, what do you want me to do in this situation? Because we know the answer to that, don't we? The answer is, don't get angry. That's what God wants us to do in those situations. But why? Why do I get so angry and frustrated? Why has this relationship broken down? Why do people find me difficult to work with? That's a, a question, a prayer for discernment. Why am I so willing to break the soldier's covenant? Why am I so willing to go in that direction? Why do I make bad choices? Not what choice should I make, because God would say you need to make the good choice. But why have I made the bad choice? Why do I feel so alone? Why am I fearful about this thing or this situation? Why, God, do you seem silent when I pray? Why am I refusing to take this step that I know God is asking me to take? Those are discernment questions, praying for discernment. It's important to pray for discernment because discernment helps us to see the difference between right and wrong. It helps us to see the difference between what's sacred, what's holy, what's the path and the life of holiness, and what's selfish, what we're doing for our own benefit. It helps us to see why what we are doing, whether what we are doing is God-serving or self-serving. It helps us to see what in our life is healthy and what is unhealthy, what's freeing and what's enslaving what's true in our lives and what's false in our lives, what's helpful and what's hurtful, what's unifying and what's divisive. So my question for all of us this morning is, will we pray for discernment? Will we pray for discernment? I have to say to you that if the answer to that is yes, then that's a pretty bold answer particularly if life is going well for you. If you're happy and you're contented and life is good, then it's really bold to ask God for discernment. It's relatively easy to ask God for discernment if things are going badly. We don't mind asking him then, why am I doing this and where do I need to go? But if life is treating you well and you're happy and you ask God for discernment, 
then you open up to yourselves to the fact that God may say, well, actually, why you're doing stuff is wrong and you need to head in another direction. And that other direction might make you unhappy for a while as you undo some of the choices that you've made. This is how Jesus puts it in John chapter 3, reading from the Message Translation. This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so work can be seen for the God work it is. That's the choice we have to make when we decide whether or not we're going to pray for discernment. God may well say to us, what you are doing and the reasons that you're doing it are not pleasing to me and we need to head in another direction. My prayer for each one of us this morning, whether we're in the hall or um, joining in online, is that we won't run for the darkness, that we are prepared to pray for discernment, that we won't enslave ourselves and tie ourselves down by being addicted to denial and illusion, which is the world's way. That instead, we will pray for discernment. We will pray for the God light. Shine the God light on my life. Search me and know my heart. Test me. Find out anything that offends you and lead me in the right direction. We need to pray for discernment because it's only God who knows our future. Only he knows if we're heading in the right direction. If you're willing to pray for discernment this morning, then I invite you perhaps just to close your eyes. And will you pray this prayer with me this morning? Lord, thank you for the people that you have divinely placed in my life who speak holy truth, love, and words of wisdom. Give me a heart of discernment to know when you are using someone to speak instruction into my heart and my circumstances. And give me the strength and courage to follow through with that advice, even when it's hard. Fill me with peace in knowing that even if I take a wrong turn, your purpose will prevail. In your word, you said that if anyone lacks wisdom, then we should ask of you who gives liberally to all without reproaching. Lord, I therefore acknowledge that I need the wisdom that only you can give. Pour upon me your spirit of wisdom in its fullest measure in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that you give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, the eyes of my heart being enlightened that I may know the hope of your calling and the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints and the immeasurable greatness of your power towards me who believe according to the working of your great might. Father, I need wisdom that only your spirit can give me. Help me not to lean solely on my own opinions, thoughts, or dreams, or what my society, culture, and circle have to say. I need godly, not earthly wisdom, Lord. Please supply me in knowledge and truth as I battle these tough decisions and uncertainty. Father, open my eyes to the barriers holding me back from spiritual progress and help me to walk confidently as I discern the steps I need to take in my life. Heavenly Father, thank you for your guidance. Forgive me for getting ahead of your plans and help me to know when to stop and listen for your direction. Your ways are perfect, Lord. Thank you for offering gentle grace. In Jesus' name, amen. In response, we're going to sing together song number 715, 
in the songbook. Knowing my failings, knowing my fears, seeing my sorrow, drying my tears, Jesus, recall me, me reordain. You know I love you. Use me again. As I pray for your discernment, as I pray for your wisdom, you know all about me, but will you love me and use me again? Let's sing the first two verses together. And as we do, this place of prayer is open. If you're at home or wherever you are uh, joining in online, then you can kneel wherever you are and make this prayer as we sing the first two verses together.